<laughs> Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Pedals, Pitches, and Pixels, an introduction to harp notation. This digital seminar is being presented by MOLA, an association of music performance librarians, as part of our digital classroom series. Uh, for those of you joining us from outside the organization or who haven't heard of MOLA before, MOLA provides resources and continuing education for its member librarians who encompass a wide breadth of performance organizations across the world. We also provide public resources which can be helpful for composers, conductors, and copyists, uh, and those can be found on our website. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we'd like to give a special word of thanks to the MOLA Education Committee, particularly Niz, Liz Nowland uh, uh, for her contributions to the seminar and Elaine Lee for coordinating the panel and preparing all the slides and our handout. Uh, thank you also to our board and to our administrator, Amy Tackett for facilitating the presentation. My name is Michael Ferraguto. I am the head librarian of the Cleveland Orchestra. I'm very happy to introduce our panel today. Co-moderating with me is uh, Joshua Ludi, librarian for the Houston Grand Opera. We are joined by two very special guests, each experts in their field. Danielle Kuntz is a contemporary harpist and harp notation coach. She is in demand as a guest lecturer at universities across the US and regularly commissions and premieres new works for the harp. Danielle holds degrees from University of North Texas and is currently based in Michigan. Philip Rothman is the owner of NYC Music Services, which provides music preparation services to professional clients uh, for projects ranging from simple transpositions to large opera productions and provides publishing and licensing services for today's most sought after composers. Philip is also the editor and principal contributor to Scoring Notes, a website and podcast about music notation software and related technology. For us librarians, the conventional wisdom we learn very early on about harp parts is leave the pedalings to the player. There's not much more guidance beyond that. Uh, even the MOLA guidelines for printed music offers the scant phrase, harp pedaling should be left to the performer and not printed. That's basically all we get. So ultimately the onus of part preparation falls on the harpist. Despite this, there are ways we can help our playing colleagues, especially in cases where notation needs significant editing. Uh, the first part of today's session will focus on giving us a richer understanding of the instrument's mechanics and its performance tradition. In the second part, we will dive into proper notation and tips to employ in engraving software. And with that, I will pass it off to Danielle to get us started. All right, hello everyone, and thank you, Michael, for the introduction. So in this first section of the presentation, we're just gonna talk a little bit about the context or why the harp is such a challenge um, and then give you, we're gonna talk through like the core four areas that I like to focus on when working with composers, engravers and discussing writing idiomatically for the harp. Um, as Michael <laughs> mentioned, a lot of the focus in the guides focuses in, on the pedals, however, um, harpists will attest not all of the problematic music we encounter has to do with chromaticism or the pedals. There's other areas as well. Um, so we're gonna briefly, briefly be going through that. Before we get into those details, I do want to briefly discuss harp history. The reason for that is because even though the harp is one of the oldest instruments, it's also one of the most recently evolved instruments. So the harp in its modern form actually wasn't developed until closer to 1930, but even then still made structural improvements. So. In a nutshell, that means that the music that you've written, that has been written for the harp that you're probably finding on IMSLP or other public domain music was not written for the modern harp, but an earlier version. Um, those earlier versions include like the triple strung harp, single action pedal harp, and still at, like you see pictured the double action, early version of the double action pedal harp, which was a lot smaller. The string tension was lighter. The strings were closer together the pedals are closer together. So all of that means that a lot of the capabilities of that instrument, the strength and the weaknesses were still very different from our modern instrument. So just because it was written in the past by Mozart, Berlioz, Wagner, and worked on those instruments doesn't necessarily mean that it is idiomatic for our current instrument. Conversely, our instrument does have a lot of capabilities that was not available with those earlier instruments. So just something to keep in mind, we are at a place now that the harp has been in its modern form for a while. So we can really start to delve into refining our notation, our writing, and better understanding the capabilities of the harp. 
So moving on to the four core areas about the harp, um, we're going to talk a little bit about just the mechanics of playing primarily the hands. And then after that, we'll discuss, you know, the range of the harp, we'll talk about the pedals, and then we'll talk about some readability issues. So first off, the hands, we tend to compare the harp to the piano in a lot of ways. There's a lot of similarities as far as the range. You can actually go back to the previous slide. Um, a lot of similarities in your know, range, the ways that the hands work. Um, however, there's a few key differences. Number one being that the hands, we don't use our pinky fingers. So what this really means is we really only have four fingers available at any given time to be able to play. That doesn't mean that we are playing all four fingers all the time, but we don't have that fifth finger available for five note patterns, five note chords, things like that. The second thing is that the layout of the hands is a little bit different. So on the piano, when you're playing, you'll notice that your hands are in contrary motion or kind of a mirrored image. This means that your thumbs are on the inside, fingers on the outside. So if you're thinking you know, idiomatically about interval patterns that work well, your larger intervals will be where the thumb and the second finger. Smaller intervals will be more comfortable between your know, fifth, fourth, and third fingers. So smaller intervals on the inside of patterns, Sorry, I said that backwards. Larger intervals on the inside patterns, smaller ones on the outside. This is different from the harp where the hands are both in the same direction. You have your thumbs on top, fingers on the bottom. So generally speaking, you will have larger intervals that are more comfortable on top, smaller ones on the bottom. So it's a little bit of a flip from how you think of it on the piano. The second thing I wanna bring up um, has to do with the motions of playing, which in short, the action or motion that is required to play a single note on the harp is a little bit more involved than a comparable note on the piano. So on the piano, you're really using a drop motion. You're working with gravity. You can either use your finger, your arm to be able to play, but it's really a single motion. On the harp, it's actually four motions and you don't have to memorize this. This is just to give you an idea um, of how it takes a little bit longer to play a note on the harp, but you have to place your finger on the string. It's not, quite as direct as just going back and forth. You have to kind of come around the string. You have to make sure you have good contact with the string. You'll close. That's what we think of as actually playing a note. Then you reopen to then be able to play another note. So it is kind of a four step motion. Now, you know harpists can play faster than that. Um, and the way that we work around that is by blocking or by placing multiple notes together at the same time. So rather than doing those four motions individually for each note, you'll put, you'll place multiple fingers together, press, and then you can either play those notes together or individually. And that's really how we can play fast is by placing in those blocks. So the way to think about that is harpists are really thinking in terms of vertical patterns, even when the notes are linear. Um, this example that I have on the screen can kind of give you an idea of how that works and also brings up the concept of directional placing. In general, there's a few exceptions, but in general, harpists are placing the patterns that go in the same direction. And the reason is we just don't have the same finger independence or finger dexterity in the sideways position that you would have with the piano position. You can move your fingers a lot quicker. So in order to work around that, we're really placing in single directions, and then if the direction changes, it's starting a new group. Just something to think about. Um, we can go ahead and go on to the next slide just to give you a couple of examples on the screen. Um, and this really thinks about interval spans. So this is an example from du the Ducas Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, this is one of the famous rewrites that we're gonna be talking about a little bit later in the session, but just kind of to give you an idea of how these finger spans are working. Um, you'll notice that this right hand, there's, I, I first want to give you an idea. I realize I can't actually annotate on the screen the way I usually do. Um, so when it comes to intervals on the harp, you'll notice that a lot of the intervals between those lower notes has a pretty wide span. And that's part of the reason that we do have to split this into two hands. This also goes really fast. This is like, you know, one measure glissando going on. That's why we do have to admit the left hand just because you can't really place it that well. 
we'll talk about rewrite strategies in a little bit, but this is just kind of you an idea, idea of why this section is problematic is just because of those wide interval spans, you can't quite play it fast enough to be effective in this context. So this is about, you know, just the mechanics. We can go ahead and move on to the pedals. Actually, another range. We'll talk about the range. So another component of playability on the harp has to do with the range or the full registers of the harp. Um, it is a very similar range to the piano, give or take a few notes at the top or bottom. However, there's a couple other components. It's not that, you know, you play one note and it's going to sound almost the same as the top. You have to think about three elements, which is the resonance of the harp, the timbre, or like how it actually sounds, because um, the registers do sound very different, and then the physical balance that you have to navigate as you're playing. Um, I have the harp divided into four categories. Um, a lot of sources will divide it into three, but just because of some differences in the mid register of the harp, I do find it helpful to think about it in four. So the lower register, you have your wire strings. These notes are going to ring for a really long time, actually up to a minute. You have a very metallic-y sound here. It does have a lot of clarity, but unless you come back and muffle the string, it's going to ring for a really long time. That can add to, that can create a lot of blur in the sound. In your mid register of the harp, you have the gut strings, so that you'll have a slightly warmer timbre, but it still is going to resonate for quite a long time. This means that if you write really tight intervals in that register, you're going to have what we harpists like to refer to as a muddy sound. Very technical, I know. Um, but you have buzzing if you're trying to replace too quickly without cleaning up that sound. So sections that are passages that are using really tight intervals in that register can become problematic. Um, then you have your mid register. You still have that warm sound, but you notice the sound decays a lot quicker. Um, so you don't have quite the same concerns with resonance in this mid register. And then the high register, we have a different string material here. We typically use nylon strings, which gives a very percussive sound that dies away really quickly. So this can be um, extremely effective actually in large ensemble because this is the register that can cut through um, a thicker texture. Um, and then as far as balance goes on the harp, a harpist can play pretty comfortably in the mid register. When you go to the low register, you notice I have to actually lean forward to reach those notes. I'm changing my body position. Um, that affects, you know, balancing the harp with my leg, navigating the pedals, things like that. Top register, I'm having to twist a little bit. You notice my shoulders no longer in contact with the harp. Um, so it's a body shift to be able to play in these low and uh, low and high registers. So just something to keep in mind, something that is sits a long time in the low register is not going to be super comfortable. Same thing with the top, as well as quick shifts between your low and top. So a lot of considerations when it comes to register. We want you to use the full range of the harp, um, but there are some logistics to think about with that as well. Um, so next slide, I do have an example for you. This is a famous harp solo, um, the Foray Impromptu. Um, this opening is difficult for a lot of reasons you might not expect. Um, I want you all to take a quick look, try to think of what might be a problem, and then I'll play it for you. So the things I want you to look for, I want you to look for the register that this is in, look at the interval sizes, and think about what kinds of problems you might anticipate. I'm going to go ahead and play this for you. I apologize, it's not in my fingers, but you'll, you'll understand why this is a challenge. <laughs> expected. Um, so the problem with this, um, this section, we actually have to spend a lot of time trying to clean it up. And the reason is because number one, you have those tighter intervals in that low register of the harp, um, especially in that first 
first measure, those notes are going to continue ringing. And if you're not careful with the replacing, you're going to have an ugly buzz. Buzz. Plus, also, there's not a lot of clarity in the sound because you have all of those notes ringing at the same time. Second, those big intervals at the bottom of the note, bottom of the chords in the left hand are really uncomfortable, really difficult to replace um, cleanly while also avoiding that buzzing. This is not my favorite piece of all time. Um, but a simple solution might have been just leaving out a couple of notes in these chords, making those left hand three note chords rather than four note chords. It would create a little bit more space for that resonance, also avoiding the buzzing, but just give a lot more resonance without having to quickly muffle and navigate around those. So just something to think about. Um, harp solos are not always the best example of idiomatic harp writing. I will move on from that. The next section, um, we'll talk a little bit about the pedals. Um, I assume that a lot of you are familiar with the pedals just because most of the resources out there really focus in on the pedals. I have the pedal chart here because this is such a useful tool, both for you, whether you're a composer, engraver, um, or a harpist, being able to keep track of those pedals. Um, use the pedal chart. Um, the way it's laid out, you have three pedals on the left foot, four pedals on the right foot. These pedals work together to change the pitches on the harp. Um, so the pedals are connected through the pedal rod into the action at the top of the harp, and then it's affecting all the notes on the harp. So if I change the C pedal from flat to natural, it's changing all the C's on the harp, not just one. And like I said, there are a lot of resources out there on pedals and chromaticism. We're going to be talking a lot later about, you know, formatting that notation plugins that you can use to think through those pedals. So let's go ahead and move on. I do have one example just to give you some insights into how these actually work on the harp. So this is from the Tchaikovsky Romeo and Juliet Overture. Um, this is my handwritten score. But in this section, you just you can see how those pedals are working. The hands are actually staying on the same notes in some of these examples, um, or some of the same notes. So that shift from C natural is really achieved by just the pedal, not the notes. Um, we could talk about, you know, speed and timing of pedals, but that is a long discussion um, that we could have. Feel free to put some questions in the chat, and then if we have time, we can discuss that as well. Um, let's go ahead and go on to readability, because that's kind of a big topic that we will be going through today. Harpists get nervous about music, and a lot of the reason is just because it's a little bit more difficult um, to navigate music as a harpist simply because number one, we are a little bit further away from the music stand. My music stands out of the screen, so it's even more further away than usual. Um, but we're sitting at the harp, usually the music stand's gonna be right here, so we can't have it as close as we would. We have this issue with triangulation, which is really a fancy way of saying we're having to look in three different directions at once. Harpists play by sight, not by feel, simply because the strings feel very similar. You know, adjacent strings or strings in the same register feel very similar. So when we're making big jumps, we are having to look to double check our notes. That means that we're looking between the music, the strings, the music, the strings, the music conductor or other musicians, music strings, this back and forth. So music that's cluttered or difficult to read, it's easy to lose our place just because of that having to look quickly back and forth. There's also a lot of extra markings that are necessary in the music, like pedal charts, pedal markings, slurs. Sometimes we'll write in different fingerings. Um, so we are picky about our music for good reason, which is why we're going to get into a lot of that today. Um, but we can go ahead and go on to the next slide. We'll be talking a lot more about notation. The last thing I want to bring up, um, or actually the next topic that I want to discuss, is just the role of harp in large ensemble. A lot of you, that's um, how you're going to be navigating the harp. And sometimes if you think about having to rewrite music or make edits, it's helpful to think about what the role of the harp is. Um, this is very much an oversimplification, but I wanted to bring up kind of three key areas. So first, you're thinking about the harp as more of a texture filler. Um, this happens in a lot of like the romantic era symphonies, 
where the harp just has like big arpeggios throughout a big section. You're not hearing the harp, but it's definitely adding to the texture and filling out some of that space. Um, this is an example from Don Juan where the harp really has, I don't think you want to hear me play this. Um, those types of arpeggios all the way through. You're definitely not hearing that, but it does, it adds to the music. Um, the next example is more soloistic sections. So this is where the texture is extremely thin in the ensemble and the harp is coming in for a very specific moment. Um, this is from WC's Prelude to the Afternoon of the Fawn, um, Afternoon of a Fawn. This is where the flutes has a solo and then the harp has these accompaniments. Here. This is very exposed, so you are hearing this. So if you were thinking about a rewrite, this is, doesn't need a rewrite, but this would be more difficult to navigate just because it's so important to the full texture. And then the last example is using the harp as a doubling tool. So I have kind of the score here from the Sorcerer's Apprentice again. I know we had mentioned it before. There's some playability issues, but in terms of the orchestration, this is really effective in its use of the harp. So this specific example, the harp isn't solo, but the harp is doubling other instruments. So it's adding a little bit more of a punctuated attack um, to these wind instrument solos. I think it's really beautiful. And it's a really effective use of the harp. A lot of wind symphony music um, uses the harp in this role, whether it's doubling flutes or doubling clarinets or doubling percussion. Um, the harp doesn't always have to be solo, but doubling other instruments is really effective. But sometimes we have problems in um, large ensemble music, and this brings us to the section, if I'm remembering right, what we're doing, common challenges. So harpists kind of have our little underground network of rewrites. Um, a lot of times what we play is not what you're going to see if you're looking at harp parts on IMSLP, just because a lot of these parts aren't actually playable as written, thinking about Wagner's Magic Fire music, which is the example I have here. Um, there's sections from Don Juan, there's sections um, all through the repertoire. So we have rewrites that we've worked and refined over the years that are passed down teacher to student to student. Um, the problem is most of them are not actually engraved. Um, you can see there's the original rewrite, which has a lot of double sharps involved in it. Um, you can't actually play it as written. There's a lot of pedals that we have to change to make that playable. So I have a picture of the handwritten rewrite, which is what I got from my teacher, which if you're having trouble reading it, welcome, welcome to the camp. Um, I had trouble playing it too. So I found a excellent engraved rewrite from harpist Elizabeth Jackson. This saved me when I had to play this in an audition. Um, but we don't have engraved rewrites for a lot of the scores. So that's kind of a challenge. Um, sometimes when we have to find rewrites, we're asking our whole network posting on Facebook groups, does anyone have a rewrite for this specific piece. Um, someday I would love to see these published. We have some of them published, as you'll see in the next slide. Um, this is a famous collection from Sarah Bullen, the principal harp book, where she publishes rewrites of a lot of the standard scores that are asked for in auditions. Um, this is a really great resource if you're wanting to just kind of see what types of rewrites harpists are doing. I will say, though, um, not all harpists do the exact same rewrite. So this is, you know, Sarah Bullen's edition. I mean, she's an incredible harpist, um, played with the Chicago Symphony for years. So she's um, a major league harpist for sure. Um, but I've had my teacher say, um, she takes a little bit too much liberty. I'd like you to do this rewrite instead for your audition, things like that. So it's not completely codified. There might be some problems in there. Um, but the unpublished rewrites, that's one challenge that we have to deal with. Next slide is, Handwritten parts. This is really common, not only for rewrites, but for things like film scores, musical theater. Um, this is an example that's you know not musical theater because I threw away all of my really badly notated copies of scores because I did not want to play them ever again. Um, but we get a lot of music that looks exactly like this. And if you're having trouble telling if a note is a D or an E or whatever, Welcome to the club. And this is actually a not very bad example compared to some of the stuff I've seen in the past. Um, these types of concerts also, these are often in pop concerts or film scores where we don't have a lot of rehearsal time. So if we get the music at the first rehearsal, we have to spend 
all the time between then and the concert trying to like retype it out so it's actually readable. Um, fun challenge. And then the other issue is sometimes things that are notated fine but are just flat out really, really awkward. Um, this is from Nightmare Before Christmas. I'm not going to play this, um, but you might think, look at it and think, oh, this is really effective for the harp. Actually, I will play this. I lied. Um, I just want to look. This is full of things like this, but I just want to look specifically at that first line that you see. You might think, oh, this is fine. Right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand. Then you have to jump down to that low chord. If it was at that tempo, not a problem, but it's kind of more of what we're looking at here. You want to be able to play it more accurately and louder than that. Um, it's not as really an issue of practice because you have those repeated notes that you're having to wait in place. So you can't play that accurately. So we get things like this all the time, especially if, you know, a conductor arranges a part for a holiday concert. We love conductors, but sometimes the harp writing is a little, a little iffy, but things like this, especially if we get the music last minute, there's not really time to rewrite it and make it playable. Um, then whatever, next slide. I don't remember what's on the next slide. Okay, so that was my discussion of just the common challenges that we encounter on the harp. Um, so just kind of a summary of the core four that we want to keep in mind that does affect these playability factors is just the mechanics of playing. Sometimes things are take more motion or more time to do on the harp than if you're thinking about it on the piano. If it's playable on the piano, it might be playable on the harp or it might be playable on the harp at a slower tempo, but it's not guaranteed. There's those differences between the registers. You have to keep in mind the resonance of the harp. The harp, unlike the piano, it does not immediately dampen. It doesn't require action to keep sustaining the sound. It requires action to actually stop the sound, clean up the sound. That's a very different way of thinking about it. You want to think about it a little bit more like a pitched percussion instrument rather than a piano that self dampens. We have the chromatic capabilities, thinking about those pedals. Um, are the pedal changes possible for what you have in mind or are they not? And then that factor of readability, which is what we're really going to be delving into in the next section. So Michael, do we have any questions that we want to go through here? Uh, we haven't had many come in through the chat. Uh, however, I think on behalf of the librarians here, um, you know, when we get a piece of rental music in, oftentimes, sometimes it'll be totally clean. Sometimes it'll be totally marked up. Uh, what do you like to receive as a player? We should probably not erase what we get, right? Unless it looks like a total disaster. So I, what has happened, what I really like getting is a copy with the markings and then a blank copy without the markings. Mm -hmm. That's happened a few times and it's absolutely amazing in case I want to change stuff. I will say, especially if we have a digital tablet, it's really easy to cover up stuff that we don't want to play. But having those markings can save a ton of time, especially if those markings are done by harpist. Um, we don't have to go repedal something. We can see any adjustments that they made, any edits that they made. So I would say leave in the markings, please. It saves us so much time. And for placing intervals, um, is there what is what is the like extreme? What is the limit? I, I was seeing, you know, in the the four A example, there was like a you know fourteenth or something. Is there just a certain you know you're not going to get beyond a certain range? So harpists can generally reach a tenth. Um, it's we have a slightly larger span than on the piano, so a tenth is usually comfortable. You'll see though that that does stretch the hand, so we don't want to do that all the time. So generally an octave is your average or what you should focus on seventh to an octave. A tenth is possible. However, we do often since harpist roll chords, which is something that we're going to dis discuss a little bit later, we can actually roll on to chords. So if we have a you know 14th chord or something that's really big, you can roll onto it. Don't assume um, that we can do that, but think a tenth unless it's like a big rolled out chord that we would have time to do something like that. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think so. Uh, yeah, I think we can move along to uh, notation guidelines then. 
Awesome. So I have a couple um, slides with just like commonly common things that I like, but we do have other notation experts here. So you all are welcome to interject and then I will be passing it off to um, Philip and Joshua for some specific like how to notation examples. Uh, Danielle, before we go on, I think we have one one question which just popped up in the chat, which was um, regarding the, the Elfman, the Nightmare Before Christmas. The question is, um, would it be possible to play that section by reversing the hands? That's likely what would be done. Um, I will say it's a little bit awkward to do that just because we're used to playing things descending right hand to the left hand. So you would have to practice that a little bit more. That's probably what would happen. Um, I will say that doesn't exactly solve the issue of those repeated notes. You would probably want to do like an inharmonic there. I'm getting turned around trying to think about this. I would say there's probably the best solution would do something that ex expands the hands a little bit more so you don't have them right on top of each other. So and then maybe a full octave at the bottom instead of the chord. Obviously, I've not practiced this rewrite, but might work better. Or I'm not going to embarrass myself further. <laughs> but that right, would solve and... one of the problems, though, reversing the hands. Great. And uh, one other question, which is, uh, do you prefer diagrams or notes marked in the score or nothing? So diagrams and charts are two separate things, and that's actually what we're going to be discussing next. We need both in the score. I would say for sure, please put in diagrams. Double check that they're correct, but make sure that they line up with the notes on the page. Um, some harpists feel very strongly that they don't want notes in the score. I think if you're thinking through the chords, thinking through the chromaticism and the note pedal changes are there, put them in we can use white out if we want to change them. That's my opinion, but I do want to emphasize those are two separate things. So the pedal charts are kind of giving you your landmark or this is what the pedal setup should be um, at this given time in the score. The pedal changes though are your step-by-step -step directions. So if you look at a pedal chart, that's your reference. You're not seeing that thinking, oh, I need to change pedals here. You're seeing that as your reference, but the actual pedal change needs to be notated by the letter in the score. Great. So yeah, I think we can uh, move on then. Awesome. Yeah. Can I just can I uh, put a fine point on that real quickly? Mm -hmm. um, when we have Lissandi, the pedal chains change uh, pedal diagram has to be there, or the you know the representation of how the pedals are uh, uh, depressed in the form of the the note names. So uh, otherwise you won't know <laughs> what, <laughs> what pedals to, you know, what the configuration is. And, um, but I, I, having taken a lot of music from a lot of cop, from composers who think they may be doing you a service, Danielle, by putting those pedal changes, those step-by-step -step pedal changes, my recommendation is unless you're a harpist and even sometimes then, <laughs> To just not even bother because you you may do a rewrite like of one of the examples that you described earlier, where you may change things around. And my my advice, uh, really, to to just about anybody is to not put those pedal those step by step pedal pedal changes uh, in because a harpist will almost surely have their own uh, preferred time and manner of doing that. And I would also say it might be a good idea just to have a harpist double check your part before you get to publication or definitely before the first rehearsal because you can get a lot of things fixed that way that can save a lot of pain for everyone later on. So if you have a harpist friend or there's harpists um, who will do score reviews, things like that, I would highly suggest doing that because then you can get pedals that work and then they're there for everyone. Naturally. So okay, I have a few general notation guidelines. And the big one, if you 
Remember nothing else. This is the one I want you to remember. Leave white space on the page. Don't try to cram too much into one page. Um, part of it is because sometimes we do have to write in different things. Like this is an example from Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet. We actually do a couple of enharmonics here just because it's nice to keep the interval shapes the same as we go up. So a nice little enharmonic works well. We'll talk about enharmonics specifically in a little bit, but there's no room to write that in the score because of how close those chords are together. We have the rewrite down below, which has them spaced out a little bit. Yes, it does include those enharmonics because it's a harpist um, edition, but just having a little bit of white space will solve a lot of problems. Don't try to cram too much into one page. We'd rather do extra uh, extra page turns than have everything squished into one page. Um, I have some full page examples on the next slide, just to give you an idea of how this visually looks. There's the two crowded version um, that just has way too many saves. The font's too small. There's just it's tough to read. And then we have a good example that's just that's spread out a little bit. Yes, this example will have more page turns. But there's room for us to make in writings if we have to say we need some pedal changes here we need some extra pedal charts or i have a different fingering that i want to notate here this you know having more white space on the page will give us room to do that um speaking of that we have page turns so a big thing to keep in mind is that harpists can only turn pages with our left hand our right hand cannot get to the music stand because it's blocked by the strings. So we can only turn pages with our left hand. Um, a lot of harpists now do use digital tablets um, and turn pages with the foot pedal. Um, it can vary whether they're using the right foot or the left foot. I use my left foot. I can't comprehend doing it with my right foot, but um, to each their own. But that does put in a extra consideration when it comes to doing those page turns. If you're thinking about traditional page turns, um, you can just put in rests on those page breaks, or even if there's long notes in the left hand, because again, the harp, you don't have to manually sustain the sound. It's gonna ring. You could play the note, turn the page, play the next note, something like that. Just make sure that there's space in there for the left hand. Um, but because if you have that digital thing, a safe rule of thumb would be to just make sure that there's not a lot of pedal changes before and after a page turn and that there's space in the left hand to achieve that. We can turn pages as long as they're thought through. And then the next one is just some miscellaneous things that I wanted to have you keep in mind. Um, eighth VA, I know flutists definitely prefer seeing those ledger lines. Um, for harpists, just because we're thinking things more in terms of register, um, it is helpful to have some eighth VA going in there Keep the readability in mind, though. You don't want to have something where it looks like you're going down on the staff if you're actually going up. Um, remember the flow, but just in general, if there's more than four ledger lines, it's nice to use 8th VA or 8th B for the bass clef. Um, rolled versus flat chords. Harpists will traditionally slightly roll any chord. Um, so this means if you have a chord, a harpist will play it slightly rolled bottom to top. Um, so the first two examples, they would generally sound the same. So if you want every chord rolled, don't write a roll in front of every chord. However, if you want everything rolled, everything flat, meaning flat, we play it all together, and less marked, you can add a note in your score and then just add a roll on the specific chords that you want rolled, or you can just add a flat um, bracket to indicate anything that you want flat and assume that everything else is rolled. So don't put a roll in front of every chord. I've seen that in chord. I've seen that in scores. It's just, it's a, it adds clutter to the score that doesn't need to be there. Um, and then harmonics. Harmonics, we generally prefer to be notated at played pitch, not sounding pitch. Um, I say generally because there is a lot of inconsistency in the Notation, we have Salzado to thank for that. Salzado is amazing, um, but that's one of his ideas that has not continued on. Most harpists do prefer notation at play pitch, not sounding pitch, meaning if it's, you would notate the C I have written there, and the sounding pitch is not octave higher. You don't need to notate the sounding pitch in a parenthesis. I just had that there for illustrative purposes. 
However, just because we have that inconsistency in the notation, it's nice to include a little note. Um, just like John Mackey did in that example, that made me happy. Um, because otherwise, we don't know. Harpists don't always know. It's not always clear from the score whether you're notating at sounding or played pitch. Um, so add a note to clarify, but in general, it's preferred to have harmonics written at play pitch, not sounding pitch. Just very quickly, how are harmonics achieved? So we can do a harmonic in the mid registers of the harp, mid and mid low. We do that by blocking or just like kind of muffling the middle of the string and then playing it to get that to ring an octave higher. Just because of the shape of the harp, we use a slightly different technique um, for the two hands. There's a lot of little fun things we can do with harmonics, but for the sake of time, I won't get into that. Danielle, I actually have a question about that Mackey example. Mm -hmm. Is he saying that the you're supposed to actually play those an octave higher than they are written to account, or no, um, or play them a, 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 an octave lower rather than how they're written because he's saying of the harmonic sound as written. It's a, yes. this is actually very confusing to me because he's he's got the harmonic, he's got the note, and he's got the octave line. So, what what where would yeah. you play that? <laughs> so I would play that an octave lower than written. You would. So he's okay. notating it at sounding pitch, not play pitch, which is not what we prefer, but. Because right. it's in all of the examples, the Salzedo manuals say to do that, which a lot of composers read those. Um, mm -hmm. We're just kind of used to there being it being one way or the other. We see both okay. all the time. I prefer played, but a lot of composers mm -hmm. will write it sounding. You just need to let us know what you want, what you're into. Okay. So in that the 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 first full bar of that example, that B, you would actually play that as as if there was not an octave line above the note uh, exactly. on the B, okay. And then the next note after that, you would play that on the middle line of the staff, but with the harmonic. So it sounds, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Harmonics are fun. Harmonic notation. <laughs> Thank I always have to do a double take every time I see a score. I'm like, what, what do they intend? Sometimes it's clear from the context, but not always. Um, courtesy accidentals, please include them. Um, sometimes they're not included, like this example um, did not have that C natural included. I had to deduce from the context that that was necessary. Um, a lot of notation softwares will put those in for you. Keep Just keep those in mind, especially across registers, just because of those pedal changes. If you have a C sharp for several measures and then nothing no C's for a couple measures, and then another measure where you have a C natural in a different register. Your notation software might not automatically put in a courtesy accidental there, but it's nice to have just because that gives us a clue. Oh, we do need to change the pedal, but keep an eye out for those bar lines and registers, those changes. And then in harmonics, I've used this term a lot today, but what we're talking about on the harp is we're playing the same pitch, but on a different string. So the example there, you see your E flat, in your D sharp. Same pitch played on different strings. Um, you, you'll notice, I don't know how good my mic is, but you will notice there's a little timbral difference between those two, which is kind of fun to play with. Um, but we also use those to simplify pedals. Sometimes we can't change an E pedal because we have to change a G pedal at the same time, and that's on the same side of the harp, but we can change a D pedal so we can make that work. Um, sometimes, like in the Tchaikovsky example, we can use that to reduce awkward interval spans. Sometimes playing an F natural feels better than an E sharp. Um, repeated notes, um, this is a really used in Schaubert's Espana. There's a lot of repeated notes in there that would be really awkward and clunky to play as written, but and harmonically it works great. Just, I think I don't remember that example offhand to be able to play it. Um, take my word for it. Um, and harmonics are great. So now we're getting into a little bit more of these notation examples, and I just wanted to add a little bit more clarification about the pedal chart format and the pedal change format. So pedal charts, those can go either in the middle of the staff or above. The big thing is you just want to be really clear about which staff or which system it's attached to. 
I've seen a lot of examples that look like that second one where you can't really tell, you assume it's attached to that second one, but you're not actually sure. Be clear. Um, in my music, I generally put them above. If you put them below, that's still okay. Just make sure it's really clear about where it's attached to. And be consistent. Don't have it on one staff above and then another one above, below. Keep it at the same place throughout the score, even if um, it's different than what I might want. I just, I want it to be consistent. Um, mm -hmm. And then the next thing, I think Joshua was saying something. No. Um, Oh, I was I was just gonna say that the pedalings below that was a that was a Salzedo um, thing that that uh, it, it wasn't that one of his one of his things of having pedals below because that's so, where, like, I can't remember. Off the end. <laughs> okay, Salzedo had a lot of very strong opinions. He was a pioneer, and we needed we needed that. Um, and then as far as pedal changes, these are the ones that you may want to leave up to a harpist, but please be thinking through it when you're composing. Otherwise you will end up with something very chromatic and we won't know, you won't know if it'll work. So think through where those are gonna be happen. The other thing is be consistent with the placement. You can put them in the middle, but I will say there's not always going to be room. Actually, there's very rarely going to be room throughout the whole score. Um, bottom is preferred, please don't put them above the staff. But again, be consistent. Don't put them in the middle some places, below other places, above other places. That just gets confusing. Um, I will say we will be talking about plugins in a little bit. I am going to mention that a lot of plugins will put the pedals as late as early as possible, at least my experience with plugins, which is a little bit limited. Harpists generally prefer those to be as late as possible. Um, some of that has to do with just the resonance of the harp. You don't want to be changing them too early and getting some buzzing. The other thing is it just makes a lot more sense to change a C pedal when you're playing a C chord rather than changing a C pedal when you're playing something harmonically completely different. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, do you put the right pedals over the left pedals or left pedals over the right pedals? This is where maybe you do want to leave it up to a harpist because harpists will have strong opinions on what makes most sense to their brain. The notation manuals say right over left, so that's what I generally try to do, um, but actually Logically, it does make a little bit more sense reading wise to have the left over the right. But again, be consistent. We can switch it if it's consistent through the score. And then I think next up is the notation examples. Okay, uh, Danielle, th this was just incredible. I know this only literally scratches the surface, but uh, just uh, I've, I've already learned a lot um, and having done music preparation for quite a long time, I'm always learning. Um, just a couple of quick comments uh, before we move on. I mean, I'm a former timpanist and it's not quite, the analogy isn't quite the same, but uh, certainly with timpanists, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to try to game out all the changes, the pedal changes in a timpani, because the player might have their own preferred way of changing the, ped the pedals on the timpani. Uh, and, and any experienced timpanist will prefer to go through the score and figure out at what point it makes the most sense for the timpanist to change the pedals. So unless you have consulted, and, you know, of course, the wild card there uh, with timpani is that some players might have three drums, some may have four, they might be tuned slightly differently. So uh, again, um, you know, I would say, unless you have really, really gone through with an experienced harpist, those things are almost always better left to the player to sort out. Um, the second thing I, I'll say in with respect to chromaticism, um, a really good illustrative example uh, is uh, this, um, I've just dropped it in the chat, uh, this is the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, the fourth movement. And uh, looking at the score uh, and hearing it are two very, very different things. And that's uh, a, um, yeah, and Jeff, I, I, we, we will have all those links. So uh, I appreciate you sending those, but those are all, we, we do have all those links that you're, you're dropping in the chat there. Um, the, the Bartok Concerto uh, uh, for Orchestra video, uh, and, and hearing and seeing the score, um, you can really see why um, Danielle had that D sharp and E flat example and why you would want to write it and as uh, how the player would play it and not necessarily theoretically how um, you, know, you might 
uh, notated with respect to music theory. All that being said, with with music, with uh, harp pedals, um, you know, we're going to talk uh, about each of the three major software, commercial software programs that is Sibelius, Finale, and Dorico. Uh, Joshua will handle the Dorico side, being the resident Dorico expert around here. Um, but uh, all the programs have their own bespoke way of notating harp diagrams in the software. However, if you just need to create harp diagrams in any software or even not in music notation software in Microsoft Word or something uh, like something like that, um, then you can um, definitely find this harp diagram font for just a few bucks. Um, and you don't even necessarily need to type in the uh, uh, order of the pedals, they will automatically, whatever order you put the pedals in there, uh, they will show up correctly in the, um, uh, in the software that you're using. So that's a quick way of doing it. Uh, they don't have any playback properties, obviously. It's just a notation uh, convenience. But this way, you can copy and paste uh, between any software platform uh, and basically uh, get a a very nice looking pedal diagram. So that's very helpful. It also has uh, a way to type in German note names if you're more comfortable with that as opposed to uh, regular uh, you know, letter note names. And it also supports solfege note names. So depending on the way you think, that might be a very helpful way of uh, notating harp pedal diagrams. Moving on, um, we're gonna talk first about uh, Sibelius and uh, I have three words for uh, notating harp in Sibelius, and they are plugins, plugins, and plugins. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, a plugin, Dan Danielle mentioned those a little bit earlier. Uh, it's because um, Sibelius and Finale, not Dorico, but Sibelius and Finale, that doesn't really have any particular um, way of identifying, you know, of differentiating a harp staff from any other grand staff. You know, basically with other than assigning the MIDI playback, a harp staff is just a grand staff in the notations in Sibelius and Finale. It doesn't have any special way of understanding, uh, you know, it may, it, you may be able to tag it and say, oh, this is a harp staff and then it may show the note ranges. And if you're out of range for the harp, but that's about it. Notationally, it doesn't really understand too much more than that, but that's where the plugins come, come in. And if you're not familiar with the concept of plugins, a plugin is basically a little program that's written often by a third party developer, someone who's not affiliated with the companies to solve a very specific problem and do something very quickly and automate it in a way that would otherwise take, you know, it could take you a whole day just to do something what a, for what a plugin can do in a matter of seconds. <laughs> And there are hundreds and hundreds of these things for both Sibelius and Finale that you can download. And you can find them in Sibelius, you can find them in the preferences, in the download, uh, in, the, in the plugins area. Finale, uh, there are different third-party sites that you can uh, download those from. So there are a couple that actually ship with Sibelius. So for all intents and purposes, they are actually uh, included in the software. They just happen to be found in the plugins area. Uh, the first one is called harp pedaling, add harp pedaling, and it can actually generate harp pedal diagrams from, from the notes uh, in the selection. And it can make a diagram or box text uh, in terms of how you actually display that tuning. So that's uh, a helpful one if you, basically the way it works is you select a passage and it will analyze what's in that passage and it will figure out, okay, what is the harp diagram? Um, based on the flat, sharp, natural configuration. As Danielle said, depending on how you make your selection, it may not put it in the exact right spot that a harpist would prefer to see that, which would be right before the, uh, the notes appear. But it definitely gives you a leg up in terms of creating those diagrams. Check harp pedaling is another one that ships with the uh, software. And this is basically a way of uh, warning the, the player uh, or the, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the composer actually, the person operating the software that is, if any of the notes in the selection are unplayable on the harp with the playback, with the pedal configuration specified in the dialogue. So what that means is that you tell um, 
<laughs> it's kind of the reverse of ad harp pedaling. You tell Sibelius what your pedal configuration is, then it will read the notes and basically proofread. It, is there an error here? Does, does your pedal configuration say D natural and you've written a D sharp? And if so, there will be a warning that's written in the score. So that's in the proofreading area. And that's something that is very helpful. And then it can actually draw that pedal diagram that you've specified using those radio buttons if you feel like um, you need that. So moving on, there are a bunch of downloadable plugins that um, you can download. Uh, these are all free plugins that you can download uh, in, in recent versions of Sibelius directly through the program. It's in the file preferences area. Um, and uh, my apologies, I think, it, yeah, I think it is in the file preferences plugins is, is where you'll find it. Uh, the links that you'll, you'll get uh, when you get this document um, are basically links to the Sibelius site where there are full descriptions of each of these plugins. But you can basically um, see very quickly, I'll just go quickly through what they do. Uh, alternate harp pedaling, of course, you can type in some pitch names and it will generate a list of all those harp pedal settings. Uh, which can be very helpful in, in certain uh, instances. Uh, change text accidental size. This is because the discrepancy between the, you know, the sharp natural flat and the text, the note name um, aren't exactly uh, aligned perfectly. So this can make it a little bit easier to read and it basically bumps up the size of the sharp natural flat. And it goes so on down the line, color harp strings might be helpful. Um, as you may notice on Danielle's harp, the, uh, um, you know, certain notes are colored, the F are blue and the C's are red. Otherwise, all the notes would just look completely identical and there would be no um, reference point for a harpist to know where they are, uh, unlike a piano keyboard where you kind of have the same repeating, you know, note pattern of black and white notes in an octave. So that's, that might be helpful you know, for visually. You wouldn't actually notate that, that in the score for a harpist, but it could be helpful uh, to see that if you're a beginner harp player, uh, if you're creating that material. Um, filter harp diagrams basically just will look for fil uh, pedal diagrams. If you want to delete all of them and start over, that's a quick way of getting doing that. Harp gliss, gliss pe uh, pitches. And um, you'll see on the next slide, I actually included a screenshot of this really kind of crazy and amazing uh, uh, plugin. Uh, something that um, we haven't really talked about too much, uh, or you know, more more glancingly, is those pop scores, something like an Elfman score or something like a jazz score, where where you'll see a play, you know, a harpist often, you know, <laughs> an arranger will just write C sharp major seven chord and a gliss. Uh, marking and it's up to the player if the orchestrator hasn't put it in there to figure out what those notes should be. So basically what this does is helps you generate from a whole bunch of different chord uh, uh, styles and suffixes what the pedal diagram should be so that the player, if they're not conversant in, in jazz uh, or you know chord symbols, can more much more quickly get to tuning the correct um, uh, configuration of the harp. That's very helpful. I would certainly say, you know, obviously use your good judgment on these. And there are many times as an orchestrator and as a copyist where somebody will have written that and I'll have to decide, okay, do I double, you know, say if they say C minor seven, do I say, well, do I want a C minor seven scale or do I want to do something like a C, a D sharp and E flat uh, and try to game it out that way. So I'm minimizing any chords that uh, notes that aren't in that specific four note chord that can be kind of tricky to do, but sometimes that's what's desired. Moving on, there are a few other plugins uh, in Sibelius. Uh, harp diagram from tuning will basically, that is one that is, is very simple and effective where basically you just type in more or less kind of like how I showed you in that harp diagram font, but you have to do it in a very specific order, D flat, C, B sharp, E flat, and so on. And then it will just create the diagram and it, it's pretty simple. Uh, this one, harp gliss and octave notes, uh, sometimes gliss on D are written like this. And so that you don't have to go through, you know, creating individual cue notes and spacing and all that, this actually creates what you see on the screen using a plugin. Um, and then label harp diagrams, uh, the, Sibelius and all the program, uh, Finale anyway, have hidden text, which can sometimes be helpful. 
uh, so that it creates some additional information there so that you can um, you know, identify basically what is uh, in, in the diagram without it necessarily printing in the score. So that's, that's helpful uh, for that. And, uh, you know, some of the other Sibelius resources that we have, and, and we'll just very quickly go through uh, these as well. There's a, a harp uh, font called Norfolk Harp Standard, uh, specific for use in Sibelius. And uh, that's uh, included with Norfolk, which is a font that you can download at Notation Central. And um, this is a very easy way of getting a lot of extra harp diagrams. You can basically copy from the source document directly into your uh, Sibelius file once you've installed the font. And um, that's a, a very nice uh, way to do that. And there's a little explanation of what each of these symbols mean if you're not familiar with them. It's actually just a good reference in general if you don't have the Salzado handy, for instance. Uh, speaking of, uh, uh, well, so Bob Zawalik was involved. Uh, Bob Zawalik is legendary to those of us that use Sibelius, a very expert Sibelius user and plugin developer. Uh, he wrote this guide called Notating Music for Harp in Sibelius. And uh, we've made that available in the ebook uh, on Notation Central as well for free. So you can download that. It's about a 45 page book. Um, that goes through many of these concepts in detail. And uh, that's really helpful. Um, and uh, it, again, it is specific to Sibelius, but there are some good general tips in there as well. Um, and then finally, again, another uh, example that uh, Bob created is uh, something that is a, a companion to the composer's guide to writing well for the modern harp. Um, and you can actually download some example scores that were used in that book that is, uh, that's published. Um, and I believe, oh no, I have a few other Sibelius items real quickly. S-shaped slurs that we um, talk about a lot. Uh, and we see this not just in harp music, but in other keyboard music as well. Basically these slurs, uh, you'll see when we get to the finale side, they have handles much like they do in finale. You just basically dra drag that second handle from the left or the second handle for the right, up or down. And that's how you create that slur. You do have to sometimes fiddle with the magnetic layout settings so that they don't snap to the, the incorrect spot uh, in, the, in the notation, but that's how you do those. And uh, as far as uh, cross staff notation, it's not something that Sibelius does particularly well with respect to this, this type of cross staff notation that I'm showing you on the screen. The workaround to do these is to basically drag the stem up or down so that it aligns with the stem on the next staff. Uh, there's no concept of doing this in Sibelius any other way um, in, in terms of notes that are uh, chords that are split between this, the two staves. And you, know, you can flip the note in the opposite direction so that it aligns in the correct direction with, with what's on the uh, subsequent staff. But um, that's, those chords aren't really attached in any way, shape, or form, really, truly speaking, in the software. And if you, for some reason, make a lot of space between the two staves of the grand staff, you might find that they separate and you have to drag that stem further down uh, to reattach them. That's how it works. Uh, the other way of cross staff notation, if you have a beam group of notes, uh, this is uh, achievable in Sibelius. Again, not specific to the harp per se, but we do see it in harp notation. And there is a shortcut for that. And you can see what that is. Uh, it's control, uh, control shift down arrow or command on the Mac, command shift down arrow and obviously up shift up arrow for the for, for the other direction. There's also something in the ribbon if you can't remember those shortcuts to do that. You'll see that uh, literally in the ribbon, there's a little picture of a cross staff. Um, and that's how you would do that if you need to notate that. And with that, we'll go to finale. And uh, again, you know, this is an introductory session, so there's so much more <laughs> here, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of a, of a taste of where to find further. Uh, information. And again, you know, like I said, all these links will be available to you uh, in the document that um, is, uh, is being presented. 
So, you know, don't worry about frantically searching the, for those uh, online at this very moment in time. Um, creating harp diagrams in Finale, uh, I've, you know, I've outlined this step. Basically, there is a multi-step process that goes through the category designer. And the category designer is where you set different categories of expressions. And it's probably not worth the time right now to explain each of these steps because it's just, it's too much to go through, I think. But if you go to the next slide, you will basically see the end result. And like I said, in the very last, it's basically an O is a pedal up marking, a shift O is a pedal setter to marking, a P is a pedal down, a shift P is a separator. As I said, don't question it, just type O-P-O-P-P-O-O-O -O -O -O, and magically a harp diagram will appear. Again, this harp diagram really isn't anything special. It has no playback purpose. It doesn't do anything, anything else. So if you, you know, want to get that harp diagram font, you find that a more natural way of actually typing in DCBEFGA and just install that font and have it available in all your software. You know, that is certainly um, more than uh, sufficient. And you could create a, a category in Finale that uses that font. In, as the default font. So that would be an alternative method, but this is the official finale method of creating these. There is also a way of doing it with the shape designer or something and, oh, you know, God help you if you, uh, if you use that. So um, anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, and, and so finally you see the result, there it is. Uh, the good news is once you do that, you can actually duplicate that expression. That is very easy to do in finale. You don't have to recreate this process every time. And then you can just, you know, if you have a di diagram that's uh, identical in all respects but one, you can only literally change that from an O to a P. That one little note will change, and you can use that diagram. But again, you have to basically create a separate diagram for every harp configuration that may be in your score, and there may so there may end up being a lot of them depending on you know how long and complicated your piece is. But it is possible. And for completeness sake, we thought we should mention those here. Uh, moving on, a couple other finale specific items before I turn it over to Joshua. Uh, there are a couple of plugins. Um, if you use something called Lua, which is a programming language that uh, is used uh, in finale more and more, there's a lot of really cool plugins, a lot of activity going on there. Um, and uh, that link will, will uh, direct you to the two harp uh, specific plugins. One is by Yari Williamson, and uh, the other one, I believe, is uh, uh, Jake um, um, uh, Winkler uh, created the other one. And uh, one will uh, basically, you can create a septuplet and then run the plugin, and it'll automatically create those little gliss notes that I showed you, very similar to what's done in Sibelius. And then a heart pedal, pedal wizard, again, this is another plugin. Um, it's probably without, you know, outside of the scope of our presentation to demonstrate how those work, but be advised they do exist. And if you use Finale a lot and you want to do these things, you, you, it's well worth the time to figure out how to download and install those plugins because in the long run, they'll save you a lot of time. Uh, finally, uh, in Finale, um, we have, uh, again, cross notes, uh, cross staff notes. Even though this is a plugin, technically, remember in Sibelius, we had bundled plugins. Same is true in Finale. They bundle some plugins, including some of the JW plugins with the most recent version of Finale. They have a, a light version of what's called the TG tools. Uh, uh, Tobias, Tobias uh, um, uh, uh, Geezer, I believe is his last name, uh, created these. And this is a way of getting cross staff notation, not just with harp notation, but with any notation and you can run the dialogue or there are shortcuts that are basically included with this. You don't have to do anything special. This is included with every installation of Finale. In the main, it works very similar to how Sibelius works. You invoke a shortcut, the note pops to the top or bottom staff. Um, and uh, I think there's just one more Finale slide and very similar to Sibelius, this is a little bit more detailed explanation. It works really quite similarly in Sibelius. Those are what those handles look like. And you can kind of see the left diagram is from the Finale manual and it kind of shows you what each of those handles do. And the right one is what that uh, bow tie actually looks like if you actually drag those handles into position to create that S-shaped slur. 
Um, obviously, that those those bow tie lines won't print. That's just for you know what you would see in your score to show you how those all are all, all connected uh, with respect to the slur. And uh, then we will uh, turn it over to Joshua and take it from here for Dorico. Thanks very much, Philip. So um, Dorico is very similar in general design philosophy to all of these other software. Uh, I mean, even just that that slur diagram that you have, it's the same you know same trapezoid when you are you're kind of graphically editing things. But uh, one nice little leg up that that Dorico has is um, is part in parcel to the program is that it does have um, a, a, a an understanding in a way of recognizing that a harp instrument in the score is different from other grand staff instruments and it has different properties associated with it, both in terms of the general range, but then also in harp, harp pedaling and tuning. So um, that's very nice to have. So it's currently the only notation software that has that um, natively to that, but obviously we've seen that, you know, you can, you can execute all of the exact same workflows and things that you need for to, you know, to, to publish and create hard parts in those programs. But, um, uh, but having, having this as part of like native, you know, native support is, is pretty nice. And, you know, uh, the, the guys at Steinberg are, you know, continuing to update things quite a lot. So it's nice that it's kind of like on their kind of official roadmap, you know, which is just nice. So, um, when you have, I mean, if you open up a score and you put a harp in there, it's just going to presume that the harp is just tuned to C major, you know, all, all pedals in the, in the middle and that every, all the notes are natural. So, uh, you can see here, I've, uh, you know, a C major chord, and then you go up chromatically, uh, from there. And it, there's all these pitches where it's like, well, I can't play this because I know you have the pedal set this way. So, uh, that's very, very handy when you're looking through a part of just, getting that kind of immediate feedback of like, okay, there's, you know, there's stuff happening here. And if I'm going to, you know, try and make a, a good part, then I either, I either need to at least be aware of it. If not, you know, go in and actually put in all of these pedals and things in Dorico, which it allows for. And one thing, which uh, I don't think we've talked about today at all. And Danielle, you can correct me um, if we're wrong here, but I think in a recent update, they even, uh, it, some somebody brought it up as just like a piece of uh, piece of trivia or whatever, but the the lowest C and D strings on the harp uh, aren't affected by the pedals. They have to be pre tuned for each performance. Is that right, Danielle? That is correct. So we do have flexibility. We are willing to detune those, you know, to have a D flat if we need that. But that does need to happen between pieces rather than in the middle of the piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Interesting. So, well, so one thing that it will also do is that if you if you have a uh, if you put in these these pedal changes, it'll hold track. It'll keep track of the tuning, but it, it will understand that for the most part within a within a project, the the tuning of those two lowest strings uh, is not actually possible. You just kind of have that's the only bit of kind of like our pedal tuning that you using the program have to be aware of beforehand and kind of keep keep track of what you know what you want if you're going to use that. So. Um, so the way Dorico does this is just um, in write mode, um, which is kind of your main uh, composition window. Um, you can go into the write menu uh, at the top and, and very far down a, a long list of items is calculate harp pedals. And this, you know, essentially really works the same way as the plugins in Sibelius and Finale in the sense that uh, you either select, uh, you either make a selection or if you just select an area in your score and cal calculate that, it will basically give you the pedal diagram that works until, you know, there is some tuning where, you know, you have a C natural here and a C sharp there. And obviously you can't have those executed in the same tuning. So it'll it'll essentially calculate the, the pedals as far forward as you can. Uh, keep in mind, as Danielle said that, you know, all of these programs pretty much, you know, they, they, they work from the point that you select all the way forward, whereas harp, harpists very often might want to have their their tunings done a lot closer to where you know their actual relevant harmonic change is. So you still you know need to have your thinking hat on, you know, and and be kind of ju judicious about where you're using this and where the best place to represent this information is for your for your harpist. But Dorico definitely makes it um, uh, pretty accessible on hand to access this and the additional visual information about pitches that are outside the current pedal diagram is very, very helpful. You know, if you're somebody like me who, you know, had, uh, 
is neither a timpani player or a harp player, you know, so the, the concept of really having to think about this stuff was, was new for me. And when I work on harp parts, you know, it's nice to have the program kind of working in, in consort with me to <laughs> remind me to keep track of these things. So you can uh, put in a pedal diagram um, and by default, I believe in a harp part, it'll appear as a diagram, but because it's this, it is this kind of sentient object in the program in a, in a score, I believe it defaults to actually just all seven um, pitch names. And you can go and lay out options in Dorico and you can change those if you want dynamically, uh, which is which is pretty handy to uh, to be able to do. So, and, you know, if you're going through a part, you can just kind of work from, you know, red note to red note and, and start to identify what it's actually going to take to, you know, perform the music uh, that is written into your file. So, um, moving on, the other nice thing about this, and again, similar to the plugins available in the other programs, is um, you can enter um, harp pedals manually, either as a diagram or or just the note names. And the cool thing about doing it with the just the note names, which I, I had never even realized until I sat down to start working on these slides, is that you don't have to put in all seven note names. You can just do the altered notes. Again, because Dorico just presumes C major um, as a, your general pedal setting anyway. I can go in and for some chords and just type into the playing techniques popover, which you can execute with shift P. I can just type F sharp and C sharp without any space in between. Uh, and it will set uh, the pedal, uh, it will set those pedals to be sharp. So um, if you're somebody like me who until, you know, uh, 12 or 15 hours ago was typing in the entire pedal diagram to go, you know, note by note, uh, you can also Put in little hyphens and it uh, rather than using p's and o's uh you can you can use um v's and then um uh, i'm gonna call it a carrot it's not really a carrot i don't know it's like a macron or, or something but uh the shift uh, shift six on, a, on an english keyboard will will give you the the little uh, up arrows as well and so uh you can also go through and write pedals that way so that tends to be when i'm working or editing through music that tends to be what i the approach that i use because usually you know, as Daniel said, I, I don't, when it's a major section, it's nice to be able to just, you know, plop a, a, a pedal diagram at the beginning, but then usually from there, it's like, you know, either, either working one pedal change at a time to make sure something is going to work out and is, you know, conducive to performance or um, leaving the, you know, kind of the, your initial or partial pedal changes um, uh, to the player after that fact. So, but that's that's very very handy to have. Um, after that, a lot of things work very very similar to the other programs. Um, you know, uh, similar to to Sibelius, you know, uh, very handily can move notes from one staff to the next. Um, I don't actually. Uh, I realize I don't have an example of beamed groups here, as you showed with in Sibelius, uh, Philip. But um, but I wanted to showcase the thing that Dorico does do, which I believe. Sibelius still does not, as as you said, which was that um, I think in Sibelius, if I if I have an entire chord and I can select a note in that chord and try and move it down to the lower step, but I think it's going to take the entire chord with it, or really the entire voice might be kind of the more appropriate way to describe it. Um, with Dorico, right. in this case, you know, I have a uh, you know, an E and an A natural here. I can select just those two notes. And I can press N to move them to the staff above, and it will move just those two notes, and it will, you know, still dynamically understand that that is a singular chord that is housed in the lower staff, but with two notes represented in the upper staff. And so, you know, that's also very, very handy to have, um, especially, you know, when the music is still kind of like a living document and is changing all the time. So with the vertical spacing changes, you're not having to worry about stems needing to be dragged or anything. So that's um, a nice little thing to have. Um, one caveat, I actually, um, not related to this, but just because I'm looking at this, one thing which I have here, which is actually not native in Dorico, you see I have a pedal change from A natural to A flat. And this little this little line here is a, is a common notational element to say that the harpist should change the pedal there, but keep their, their foot on that pedal to, in order to execute a quick change later. So that's something which in Dorico 4.3, which is the current version, is not currently available. So that's something that I've I've added in here, May, uh, either as a line or, or a text item. I can't remember, but you know, there's there's still work to be done in the area of Harp on Dorico, uh, and that's something that uh, hopefully will come in the future. But uh, that's another handy thing um, to have. But uh, I just want to clarify that that's not necessarily any easier in Dorico than it would be in the other uh, programs. Um, 
Harmonics in Dorico, you know, again, a major design philosophy for Dorico is kind of like a, a general semantic understanding of most of the things that go into the program. So um, harmonics, rather than being a symbol or, or, or any uh, other kind of object in the software, is executed as a property of that note. So uh, on the lower uh, window of, of Dorico is this, this massive properties panel, which is just, it, you know, if you're a music notation geek, it's, you know, you're like a kid in a candy shop of everything you can turn on and turn around and flip around. So one of these little um, bays in the properties panel is for harmonics. Uh, I haven't listed the entire thing here, but you can just very easily select a note, uh, turn, turn on the toggle for the harmonic and set the type to natural. Uh, and it will take that note and it will um, add the harmonic circle to it. Um, Dorico, I believe, uh, will play back um, harmonics um, using whatever sound library you're using. However, um, you know, as Daniel said, there's kind of a there's there's kind of a discrepancy in the repertoire at at large about whether har harmonics should be notated as the played pitch as a sounding pitch. So, um, Dorico, I think, essentially uses the same la sound li so, excuse me sound library logic uh, as like a string instrument where the the notated what am I trying to say here? Excuse me. The harmonic will sound uh, at the octave that it is notated and not at the, it not sounding an octave higher as if the harpist were playing it at playing pitch. So that's just another uh, a little uh, disclosure there as well. Um, cross staff slurs work pretty much the same way as the other uh, programs. You know, um, one nice thing is. It, uh, there's a little, there's maybe a tiny bit better cross staff support in general in Dorico, but otherwise cross staff is like, there must be something very difficult about it because it's, it's, it, there's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, it's not yet uh, perfect in any of the programs, but you can, you can very, you can very easily just select um, any two notes. They can be in any voices or anything like that. Uh, but you can select, you know, just your first note, your last note, a slur, uh, or that you want to be slurred, and press S, and and it will um, give you a slur. What that looks like, uh, it could be many different things. It might look good. It might look really quite bad. Um, most cross staff slurs will will need quite a bit of adjustment uh, using kind of those those trapezoidal handles um, that uh, Philip showed us in in his finale slide. So, uh, but one thing that's nice with Dorico. Blessing and a curse a little bit is that um, you you have uh, you have actually four options for well, kind of two depending on how you think of it. But you can have a, a single segment slur, which is just a sing a single S curve, or you can also have a uh, a double segment slur in Dorico, which is kind of nice. Um, why I say it's a little bit of a blessing and a curse is that um, I, I tend to find in my own work that doing kind of the inverted bow tie method with single segment slurs tends to give me a, a little bit more of a predictable shape in terms of just what I'm used to seeing in published music and, and in other, you know, computer notated things. The double segment slur is very nice to have, and I've, I've definitely used it, but um, the, there's, there's a little bit of symmetry in the shape of both slurs that is kind of baked in. So it's, 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 you have, you both have more attachment points to move around, but you can move one and you'll get kind of a symmetrical move in the other. So it's, it's a lot harder to kind of fine tune it, even though the overall possibilities of the slur shape are bigger. So, but uh, in this particular example that I cooked up, which I think was from like the the foray uh, impromptu that you uh, showed earlier, Danielle. Um, I thought this uh, that looked really familiar. I was like, yes. I can hear this in my head. <laughs> I know it's from somewhere. Yes, yes. Uh, as as best I could, I tried I tried to steal examples from stuff that was out there. I was just like, can I do this? And uh, uh, yes, I can. So we've got about five uh, minutes left too, so we should go relatively quickly through these last couple slides. Absolutely. Thank you for the time reminder. Appreciate it. Um, glissandi are very similar to slurs in the sense that you just click your starting and ending note. You can open the ornaments popover, press Shift O, and you can just type gliss if you want a straight gliss. You can type gliss wavy without any uh, spaces or punctuation or anything, and you'll get a wavy gliss. Um, uh, I think my last thing here for Dorco was talking about representing like the first octave of, of a harp glissando. And uh, uh, this example I actually stole from uh, Elaine Gould's uh, Behind Bars uh, when she talks about this. There's there's kind of two options in Dorico. There, Dorco doesn't have the same kind of robust plugin support that the other programs have at the moment. Um, that's just kind of how the, the program works. So you have to do 
in many ways manually what a lot of those plugins do. So option one is like you you create a tuplet to get kind of the right rhythmic amount of notes that you need. And then you just hide all of the constituent information and make the notes cue size. And then you can attach the slur from there. Um, uh, option two is you can you can use grace notes as well because Dorico is very um, forgiving about placing grace notes anywhere, even if there are no notes, no principal note for them to go to. Um, while that is actually a little bit more straightforward, the only precaution um, is that it's a lot harder to adjust the spacing for that because it doesn't have like a, a principal note that it's actually attached to. So um, just something to be wary of there. So, but otherwise, um, nice you know, little little benefits to have uh, with the RICO in the harp department, but it's still, of course, a, a you know, a complicated instrument notationally that, you know, the user needs to have a very good amount of uh, knowledge and experience with in order to give the performer exactly what they need. Can we stay on that slide just for a second? Because I'd love to ask D Danielle for preference. We've, we've actually referenced this type of notation several times, the, you know, the small <laughs> notes indicating the pedal, the the configuration of the pedals. And Danielle, is there a preference or is there a reason in in where you would prefer this type of notation or just like the start note and the end note with a pedal diagram? In all honesty, I prefer this and a pedal diagram. Um, <laughs> okay. Just so I can have that reinforcement that the notes I see on the page are what's mm. represented. I mean, if the pedal di diagram isn't there, I'm gonna add it in myself. I've mm -hmm. just known pedal diagrams to be wrong. So sometimes I'm not completely positive if what I see in the pedal diagram is what the composer is wanting right there. Okay. Um, so and, and it's a little bit of distrust. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but it's really yeah. nice to see both of them. If you mm -hmm. only were to do one, I would like to see the notes. Um, like okay. This that's, that's helpful. Thank you. And then the second question again, you know, Joshua has shown the value of the rhythm that precedes the end note uh, on the second measure because you have to account for that rhythmic value. There's no, the harpist only has their part. They can't see what else is in the score. Uh, would this be the preferred way of, of showing that? Um, I've seen some people put a rest in parentheses. How would you want to, want to see that if there's any preferred way? Um, in this case, I think this is perfect. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever you do, just as clean as possible. Um, okay. But making sure that those note values are accounted for or otherwise. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot that don't include any kind of indication. Like I'm just guessing right. based on where the note is in the measure. And yeah. That might, no. that might work or that might not. That's a yeah. very good point because it's a total guessing game if you just have blank space there and you have only like, is it, is it a mistake? Is it is there notes? Is there rhythmic value preceding it? So that's very important. You always have to account for that rhythmic value. Joshua and Dorico, is that something that you added manually in some way, or does Dorico actually do that for you? Oh, no. yeah, no, that's not oh, something. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I added that as as just some text. And again, I was just copying something out of the Elaine Gould um, uh, like notation reference manual. But it, it is a very good point because some of this, <laughs> There's a lot of examples in the harp writing where you know you get kind of like the 16th note or the 32nd note flag for glissandi and it just goes up and down and you're like great and where's the top note where's the bottom note where, where exactly. am i <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, I I had, the, had, sometimes yeah. glissandi um they're not supposed to be exact so you don't have to necessarily if you don't want that you don't have to put the start and end note you can just indicate range mm -hmm. if you're wanting yeah. it just it depends on what you want mm -hmm. yeah. But there's so much detail we could go into. This could be a week long yeah. seminar. Um, is it ever, just as long as we're on the subject, is it ever helpful? Is it more helpful to indicate like the top pitch of a glissando if you're going to be going, you know, up and down? Or I've seen some scores where you get just the line and you get just kind of like a kind of a zigzag in the general shape. What's your feeling on that? Um, I mean, that works. If I see that, I'm just going to glisten that and end in that general range like within maybe five notes or so and sometimes that's what is wanted you don't want those notes articulated um if you want those notes articulated you can do those you could do smaller notes hands if you want a specific range but those notes not articulated okay great thank you um, great i realize our last slide here is a lot to unpack actually in some of them uh are we going to just lightly touch on some of these or should we um 
we might not really have time to get uh, into it. Yeah, I think this is a lot of information to uh, take in at once. So uh, there are resources and we do have, maybe we can jump to the resources that we have uh, made available uh, as the handout and the links um, so that people can, you know, go forth and conquer harp notation on their own. So yes, we will be uh, putting the handout directly in chat. Uh, and the this session will be available online in our digital classroom session section, along with the slide deck, uh, I believe at the link I just dropped in chat, molainc.org slash p slash public resources. It might take a minute to get there because it might uh, have some editing. So just um, bookmark that. Uh, I really want to thank you guys again. This was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. Uh, Danielle and Philip and Joshua for all of your expertise. Um, thank everyone else for joining us today. If you enjoyed this presentation, please consider making a donation to MOLA. Uh, you can donate by texting MOLA to 44321 or visiting mola.org slash p slash donate. Uh, remind you to check out Notation Central for uh, some of Philip's uh, amazing um, plugins, utilities, templates, other resources uh, that are used by NYC Music Services. Uh, anything else we want to add before we adjourn? Thank you. Yeah, this was this was great. I'm glad to get to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah, it was a pleasure. Excellent. Well, thanks again, and uh, happy marking, happy plucking, and uh, we will see you all at the next um, in informative session. <laughs>